Welcome everyone to the webinar. My name is Michael Snowman and I'm the Vice President of Engineering here at FB Complete. I'll be talking today about FB Complete's Haskell Success Program and more generally about Haskell adoption in industry. Before I get started, some information about how we'll be running things today. Chris Dunn will be monitoring the text chat and Q&A and answering some questions as well as bringing up questions to me at appropriate points during the presentation. We also have some time at the end of the presentation for questions. So if you have any that you want to save to the end, feel free. That said, let's go ahead and get started. So a little bit about me. I've been using Haskell for about 12 years now. I found it after searching around for a new language because I wanted a language that was going to help keep me honest. I was perhaps paranoid. I was definitely afraid that uh, the languages that I'd used to date, which uh, we won't make fun of PHP too much today, the languages I'd used to date weren't really uh, forcing me to write good code. And that's what I was looking for. I found Haskell. I was very happy with what I'd found, and I decided to invest a lot of time into making Haskell a real commercial option. Uh, and I've worked on building libraries and tools since then. And in this experience that I've had, I've definitely been able to feel a lot of the difficulties that people have in commercial Haskell adoption. Now about FP Complete. FP Complete has been around for seven years. It was founded seven years ago by our CEO, Aaron Contour. And one of our original blog posts, uh, these slides will be available afterwards. So if you want to follow the links, they'll be available on these slides. Uh, one of the earliest blog posts we have in the history of the company is something called the global software crisis. And it's pointing out the very easy to demonstrate fact there are, are more demands in the world today for software engineering than there are software engineers. And one approach we can take is to simply train more people to be software engineers. But if we can improve the productivity of the engineers that exist with better tools, we can help solve a lot of these problems. And we'll get to how, how to do that a little bit later. Aaron started the company with the idea that functional programming, thus the name FP Complete, that functional programming is one of those tools that can make us better developers, better engineers. And within the realm of functional programming, that Haskell in particular was the language that we were going to focus on. The result of this focus that we've had at FP Complete over the past seven years is that as a company, across all the different engineers that we have on our team, we have a lot of experience using Haskell in industry through a wide range of domains and a lot of different companies. So we have recently, in the past few months, started a new program called the Haskell Success Program here at FP Complete. And we're trying to give an easy on-ramp option to companies that are interested in working with Haskell, but they need a little bit of commercial support to do this. We're trying to take the most common services that we see companies looking for over and over, package them up, put it out there in an easy to use, easy to uh, consume form perhaps, and allow people to use that. In addition to providing this as a service where you're able to work with uh, our company on a commercial basis, we're at the same time trying to offer a lot of educational material to help in the same way, to really help with the adoption of, of Haskell in industry. Uh, we're putting a lot of this information available on our new website, haskell.fbcomplete.com, which is really just a place where we're gathering together a lot of the information we've been publishing over the past number of years. This talk is mostly intended for developers and team leads, people who are already mostly convinced of Haskell. If you're not 100% bought in on the idea of Haskell, that's fine. But the idea is if you're here, you probably already are mostly convinced that Haskell's at least something of a good idea. And at this point, you want to understand better what the business advantages of Haskell are, how FP Complete can help with those business advantages, and how you can promote those ideas to your coworkers, to other people at your company. This, uh, just to be clear, I'm not going to really be trying to convince anyone through this talk that Haskell is something awesome. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, make some claims about good things Haskell is able to do. Uh, don't get upset if I don't demonstrate them. That's not the point. Uh, if people are interested in that, happy to go through that 
uh, another time. So attractors and obstacles, I think I've shared one blog post in the past about this, but attractors and obstacles is a common uh, paradigm that we use at FP Complete for thinking about, about, for example, Haskell, any kind of offering that could go out into the industry. Attractors are things that people want, reasons people want to do something. So for example, I want to go skydiving because skydiving is fun, or I want to eat ice cream because it tastes good, or I want to drive fast because it's going to save me time. Those are all great things. Those are reasons to consider doing something. Obstacles are the opposite. They're the reason not to do something. So skydiving may be fun, but I'm afraid of heights, so I may not want to do it. Or ice cream is unhealthy, so I'm not going to eat it. Or driving fast is very dangerous and I might end up crashing. This, considering both sides of this, is very important to our business model because we understand, for example, with Haskell, Haskell prov uh, provides a lot of uh, attractors, and a lot of those are well understood already in the programming world. But there are also a lot of obstacles. Talking about the attractors exclusively and continuing to work on promoting those attractors does nothing to address the true obstacles that exist. And a large part of what we've been doing over the past few years is trying to, uh, trying to attack those obstacles. What we're doing with this Haskell Success Program is listening to what our customers and what potential customers have been saying for a while, things that prevent them from being able to use Haskell uh, productively and try to provide answers to as many of those as we can. So let's just, do, just as a brief overview, let's cover what some of these Haskell attractors are. Haskell has a strong type system, and we can use that to make code more robust. Overall, there's a high level of productivity in writing Haskell code. You get really great performance compared to the number of lines of code you have to write in Haskell. It scales nicely to large teams. This is one of those things that we've seen over and over again. You're able to take a relatively large code base, put a bunch of engineers on it, even people who aren't necessarily that familiar with Haskell, and because of the way that the type system guides people through, a lot of people are able to work productively, relatively quickly on such a code base. And Haskell's got a large set of libraries. There are over 2,000 libraries in Stackage today, over 10,000, I believe, on Hackage. So there really are a lot of pre-baked, there's a lot of pre-baked code out there. On the other hand, there are some obstacles. And one of the disservices we can do in the Haskell world is not acknowledge these. We can try to pretend like they don't exist, but that doesn't actually address them. Uh, these are what we see as some of the major obstacles based on the feedback we've heard. So Haskell does have a steep learning curve, especially for imperative or object-oriented programmers. Now, there's an argument to be made here, and I've heard people make the argument that Haskell would actually be an easier language to learn as a first language. Those are really interesting art discussions to have, but they're more theoretical. When it comes to industry, the vast majority of people in industry have pre-existing experience with some kind of an object-oriented or imperative programming language. For the target audience of who we're talking about, companies that are writing software today, the reality is using Haskell, teaching people Haskell in the company is going to be much, you know, it's going to be a steeper learning curve, it's significantly more steep than, say, taking your team of Python developers and teaching them Ruby. And we do have to acknowledge that, and we have to see what we're able to do to reduce that curve a little bit. One of, uh, you know, another point, which may seem a little counterintuitive at first, that there's both a smaller job pool and a smaller hiring pool when it comes to Haskell. People looking for work uh, know that there are not as many jobs writing Haskell as there are writing, let's say, Java. And companies looking to hire people in Haskell know that there are more Java developers available than there are Haskell developers available. Now, the reason I say that this might seem counterintuitive is you would think that either there are more developers in positions or more positions than developers. In, in reality, that's just not the way things work. There are geographic locations, there are, there are experience lo uh, concerns that need to be taken into account. So as a result of this, this does present an impediment to companies that are considering Haskell. There's less commercial support 
than the big languages. When we look at the big languages, a lot of them have big companies behind them that are funding their development in major ways. There are dozens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of well-established consulting firms that are able to jump in. The commercial support options are usually much higher than what we have in the Haskell ecosystem. Unclear on ramping. Now, this is one that you could argue isn't really that different than a lot of other languages. If someone decided tomorrow that they were going to learn Java, there are many different ways they could learn Java. It's not like there's one way, and there's not necessarily one way that we're going to uh, learn Haskell. But still, companies do come to us with concern that they're not always sure how to do this kind of on-ramp. There are gaps in the tooling still. Uh, the most prominent of these uh, today is uh, IDEs. This is one that comes up a lot. And there's a lot of work being done to improve that Haskell IDE engine. In Tero, we have Chris Dunn on the line, uh, the author of Intero. So there are tools to make this better. The situation is not the same as, again, I'm going to compare to Java. Java IDE support is simply superior to Haskell IDE support. And this falls somewhere between the obstacle and attractor category is it's unclear, it's difficult how to convince others of the value of Haskell. People who are on this call, people in the Haskell community have already bought in to a lot of the value that immutability, explicit effects, things along those lines bring to the table in Haskell. But it can be difficult to convince your coworkers that this is in fact a good idea. So the primary goal, if I was just gonna put it down in one sentence, the primary goal of the Haskell success program knock down these obstacles. So Haskell's 80% rule. We, we in the Haskell community tend to get very excited about all of the amazing things, the type level programming, dependent types, crazy uh, template Haskell, whether you love it or hate it, all these things that we can do with Haskell. And we often forget, and I'm including myself in this, we often forget that the very basics that Haskell provides, the explicit effects, ADTs, just a few other features, really bring a huge amount of benefit. If you're able to think back to the days when you were first learning Haskell and realizing that you were able to express things that were very difficult to express in whatever language you were coming from, that, that's the mental model that we should be keeping in mind when talking about introducing this to other people. Now, this huge value add with a, you know, a smaller set of the language is very important to this kind of industrial adoption. Because when it comes to industrial adoption, you may, have rem you may remember I said that the steep learning curve is a concern. Reducing what it is that someone needs to be, someone needs to learn in order to be productive on a project is vital. We like to, we like to set up a situation where engineers new to Haskell can be productive on a project in somewhere between two to four weeks. Now, if you're using all of the most advanced features, that's not always a possibility. Another obstacle that sometimes pops up is that companies are concerned that they're not 100% bought in on Haskell for their projects. One of the things that we like to point out, and we've seen this happen time and again, is that learning Haskell simply for the sake of learning Haskell brings value, even if you're not going to end up using it for your major projects. Haskell is arguably the best pure functional programming language or the most pragmatic pure functional programming language on the market today. And if one of your goals is to teach your team functional programming so that they can go back and write JavaScript in a more functional way, one of the fastest ways to get that to happen is to start off with Haskell. So one of the, uh, one of the obstacles we try to knock down is don't worry too much if, uh, if you're not 100% bought in on Haskell. Start doing some training for your team is worthwhile. Now that said, our hope is that we're going to be looking at working with teams that really do want to try to adopt Haskell. If we're looking at doing some kind of a training program, because that's usually where the Haskell Success Program starts, we really strongly encourage every company to have a pilot project to work on. If you do training without some kind of a pilot project, most likely your team is going to forget everything that they're learning. 
it's very difficult to hold on to the concepts without having something practical to apply it to. Now, I'm saying pilot project as opposed to converting every single line and every bit of code base that you have over to Haskell. If your goal, for anyone on this call, if your goal is to convince your boss, hey, let's try at Haskell, do not recommend that you take your 300,000 line, you know, line of code Java uh, uh, production application and convert it to Haskell over the weekend. You're gonna get laughed at and it's not gonna happen. What we found works very well is you choose some kind of a small standalone project that plays to Haskell's strengths. We'll get to this um, later as well. Usually this is some kind of a network service, so it can also be some, something like a cron job, some kind of a script that needs to run locally. Usually we see this as a network, network service. Usually you wanna do something like leverage concurrency. In the Haskell world, again, we're very comfortable using concurrency. Haskell and arguably Rust are probably the only two languages out there with the level of concurrency usage as high as it is in the classical kind of concurrency. Uh, so this is one of those benefits. Sometimes we forget in the Haskell world how good we have it with things like the async library with STM. If you choose a project that requires some kind of concurrency and you implement it in Haskell, that can really be a strong sell. Complex business logic, the fact that Haskell is able to have purity, nice testing, property testing, uh, being able to represent concepts as ADTs, representing this complex business logic in Haskell can be uh, very powerful. Another thing to keep in mind for choosing pilot projects, try to avoid projects that have a high level of integration with the existing systems. If you're looking at something that needs to call into a whole bunch of JVM APIs, that's not the time to ditch Kotlin or Java and move over to Haskell. You're going to spend most of your time dealing with things that you don't want to deal with. Also, if you know, you've got to develop some kind of a new iOS application. Can you do that in Haskell? Sure, it's, that's not the right time to do a pilot project. Choose something that's really going to work out nicely. All right, let's say that you're actually able to knock down a bunch of these basic obstacles. You're sitting down with your coworkers over some beers or other drink that you wanna have, and you wanna have that conversation. Why should we really be looking at Haskell? What does it bring to the table? Our claims are that this comes down to more maintainable software, and instead of trying to justify that, I have a link to a, a talk I gave I think in December on uh, maintainable software. Performance. Haskell is not the best. And again, don't try to make uh, misleading claims about this. Haskell is not the fastest language out there. C, C++, Rust, all of them are gonna be faster than Haskell. However, Haskell is within, usually within a factor of two of these languages, which may sound bad, but it's actually far ahead of the pack on most languages. And when you compare the level of productivity you get from Haskell, which is the next point. Uh, Haskell's actually, this is where I was comparing the lines of code to the productivity. Haskell is a very good contender on this. Productivity, you're able to get your projects to market quickly. And you may notice this kind of terminology. Getting things to market, that's something that you can get, go to your boss and say, this actually matters. We also like to talk about having a high bug resilience. And I had something else on my slides previously, but this quote is way better than anything I'd said previously. Strong static types don't prevent all bugs. They just prevent whole classes of annoying, avoidable bugs. So you can focus on the really hard bugs, spec bugs, design bugs, UX bugs, that's incredibly valuable. Sometimes you will see the claim going around, if it compiles, it works. And most Haskellers don't really say that today. That's usually used to mock us. Most Haskellers say, usually when it compiles, it works, which in practice may or may not be true. But the point is, Haskell is simply taking a cognitive burden away of worrying about bugs that really we want the computer to worry about. We don't want to have to think about them. Okay, so I'm getting into a little bit of a new section. I see that there are a few questions. Chris, uh, did you want to uh, ask any of those questions now?
I'm um, sorry, I was just answering the questions by text, but. If there are any questions that uh, you think would be better by audio, I can answer some of them now, if you think that's appropriate. Someone did ask about your 80% rule, to clarify what that means. Um, so, yeah, okay, on. yeah, so 80% isn't you know like a hard and fast, there's specifically 80% of the Haskell language which is good and 20% which is bad. It's definitely not something like that. 80% is just a, uh, a rule of thumb that pops up all over the place in the programming world. You guys may have heard, you know, the first 80% of the project is going to take 80% of the time and the last 20% is going to take another 80% of the time. I'm talking about that kind of 80% uh, rule. So the idea is that if you bring someone in and you say, hey, let's use, you know, let's take Haskell 98, let's throw in a few language extensions, let's take a few, you know, commonly used base, you know, uh, standard libraries, and let's write a project. Sure, you're going to be losing out on a whole bunch of really cool libraries that exist and a whole bunch of nifty language extensions. You still will likely be ahead of the curve compared to the languages that most people are using. You'll be able to do things that people aren't used to seeing from other languages. And my biggest example of this is pattern matching. Now, pattern matching is starting to become a little bit more common, but uh, in most languages, the idea that you can represent something as a sum type and you can pattern match on it and you can get com um, you know, completeness checks that you've actually checked all the different cases, this is just mind blowing. People are not used to that. And that's the kind of power we simply take for, take for granted on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, when we're writing Haskell code. Cool. Okay. Uh, other questions or should, uh, should I keep going? I flagged some other ones up. Okay. Uh, type them, sorry, type them up in the text chat. Um, I marked them as to be. Oh, answered. sorry. The Q and A. I see. Yeah. Do you see them? Uh, yes. I see the questions. Okay. I'll get to some of those towards the end instead. All right. So continuing on with, uh, with these slides. So what are some of the particularly strong domains for Haskell? Uh, concurrency, I mentioned this earlier. The async library, software transactional memory, these, uh, these provide a method of writing concurrent code that most people have never seen before. Explicit effects makes it possible to talk about a way of writing concurrent code, again, that people are just not used to, the idea that you can call fork IO, but you've got an effect versus having the you know having a function like par which is able to spark something off because it's a pure uh, function this is new and immutability by default is a game changer parsers this is one that's come up for us and in fact chris has done this a number of times for some of our uh, some of our clients parsers are something which we write on a regular basis in haskell We've got a wonderful lightweight syntax, usually using applicative syntax and do notation. We're able to use these parser combinator libraries and do things that a lot of people are intimidated by. And I remember this myself before I'd found Haskell. Parsers were black magic to me. And at this point in the Haskell ecosystem, it's something that you can just pull down a library, spend a few minutes reading the documentation and use it. Uh, streaming data, people on the call are probably familiar. I wrote the library Conduit. Conduit is one of many different streaming data libraries in Haskell. This is another one of those areas. When we, uh, when we demonstrate what can happen with this, uh, with these libraries, the way you're able to get me compact memory, rep um, uh, sorry, constant memory uh, operations for copying files in a single line of code versus what people are used to dealing with. Those kinds of things can be very impressive. And property testing, quick check. We also have Hedgehog, we have Validity. We have a bunch of libraries for this these days in Haskell. Uh, again, we're ahead of the curve on this and we take it for granted to a large extent that, hey, you're gonna write a test suite, you should use quick check. 
But again, many people out there have never really been exposed to this. It start, again, it's starting to gain some popularity, like some of these other concepts we're talking about. But we really can use these, uh, these, uh, these features of the, of the Haskell ecosystem to our benefit when we're talking about why someone should really care about Haskell. There are some areas where Haskell does fine. Uh, and as someone who's written a web server and a web uh, server framework, Let's pick on that one first. I wouldn't say that Haskell's uh, greatest thing that exists is Yisode. I, I, I simply wouldn't say that. If someone said, what's great about Yisode? I would say Haskell's great about Yisode. Yisode is simply something that is on par with what exists in other languages. But the fact that it allows you to write a web server in Haskell, that's the powerful thing. Same thing with web client libraries. Unit testing, I would argue, isn't as powerful in Haskell as property testing. We do unit testing just fine. There's no problem with it. And you can make some arguments that the fact that we've got pure functions makes unit testing really awesome. But overall, if someone said, hey, what's unit testing like in Haskell? My answer wouldn't be, oh my god, it's amazing. You've got to try it. My answer would be, yeah, we've got HUnit, we've got HSpec, we've got Tasty, and it's basically the same thing as JUnit. You're not going to be surprised. Uh, our library coverage. Uh, for the most part, most common things people are going to uh, do are covered these days in, in Haskell. There are specific niches that are not addressed. Uh, you know, I think there's some stuff around machine learning that we really wish we could catch up to the Python world in. And if we're talking about things that are specific to the, J, to the JVM or .NET, we definitely lag behind there. Outside of those, for the most part, Haskell is on par with most languages. Again, this is similar to the obstacles concept. There are some areas where Haskell does not shine. And when we're talking about considering Haskell adoption, I strongly recommend be honest about these. GUI and front-end web development, these are not as well refined in Haskell as other languages. It is not, you know, let's say someone is going to be doing Windows desktop GUI development. .NET is a better choice than Haskell for this. You can get it done in Haskell. It's going to be harder. Uh, Front-end web development. Yes, there's GHCJS. There are, are WebAssembly backends in, in, uh, in progress. It's not, for me at least, I would not recommend this to be the thing where you try at Haskell for the first time. You will end up spending a lot of time fiddling and working on things that are less interesting. If someone said, hey, what's the one thing that I should really that I'm really going to love about Haskell, I wouldn't tell them category theory. Within the Haskell ecosystem, there are a lot of people who really love category theory and think it's a selling point for Haskell. Generally speaking, that's because of selection bias. People in the general programming community are not terribly interested in category theory. For the most part, you can write production Haskell code without needing to know all the details. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with category theory, but I would turn this into something that we don't need to scare newcomers away with. The same way that I wouldn't and I'll, uh, in fact, the next bullet point, async exceptions. That's one of those things you just have to deal with in Haskell. I wouldn't say this is a wonderful, uh, amazing feature. I wouldn't start telling people why it's so cool that you're able to use a function like race and Haskell actually has a leg up versus other languages. I wouldn't try to make a claim like that. These are things that you have to deal with in Haskell, the same way that most languages have some kind of annoying rough edges that you have to put up with. And IDE support, like I mentioned before, it does come up enough that you're probably going to have to answer to, you know, explain to one of your coworkers, nope, IDE support is not at the same level. You're probably going to need to get uh, used to, at the very least, having less features in your IDE. Oh, sorry, I think I just took, okay, there we go. So, all that said, how can FP Complete help? What concretely does FP Complete do as part of this Haskell success program? The biggest, uh, the biggest place we usually start is with training. Uh, we do a lot of remote training. Uh, and again, Chris is a good person to have on the line for this. Chris has done a lot of our training. Uh, I've done a, uh, a lot of our training as well. Uh, we do training usually remotely. We uh, work with your team in video conferences. And we can custom. We can either do a standard course or custom tailor it to whatever 
skill level everyone's at or uh, skills that people are, are looking for. We can provide consulting on pilot projects, uh, setting up new projects. This is, uh, this is an interesting one to consider. A lot of the time when a company is adopting a brand new language, there's a lot of annoying costs that need to be paid in figuring out how to structure the project, how to get it to integrate with CI, how to get it to work with the deployment system, all those other kinds of things. This is one of those places where we can help short circuit a lot of those uh, wasted hours and simply provide best practices from how we've done this countless times before. We have recommended best practices. This is one of those areas where we, we do recommend don't spin your wheels and at each company come up with a new way of doing things. Try to stick to established best practices in the Haskell community. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, services we typically provide some kind of code review, pair programming, and, uh, and advising on hiring. You may remember that I, uh, I brought up the hiring pool issue earlier. And this is a real concern for a lot of companies. And when it comes to advising on hiring, we have a few different recommendations. Really it comes down to three. One is to consider hiring remotely. We've seen a lot of success with hiring people remotely. There are a lot of people in the world who are looking for a Haskell job, and a lot of people who are very skilled software developers are looking to do that. Companies have really found some great people if they're willing to consider changing geography. Uh, another option is retrain. People on your team who are experienced software developers but haven't used Haskell before, a lot of them will be very excited to get a chance to learn a new language, and it takes less time than you would think. There is that steep learning curve, but especially with some kind of structured training and uh, online materials that are available, it can take less time than you would think to get your existing team to be productive in Haskell. And finally, outsourcing, having, uh, having consulting teams, uh, and again, FP Complete is happy to step in and help uh, with those kinds of services. Overall, the goal that we have is we want you to be successful at Haskell, and you being the uh, you know people in general, the community, the uh, software community in general. We're happy to help however we can, whether that's uh, through the Haskell Success Program, whether that's providing more software and more learning material online, whatever it is we're able to do to help, that's our goal. Okay. We have officially gotten to the end of the slide, so now is a good time for uh, additional questions. Uh, Chris, did, and so I'm actually looking at the Q&A, and oh, I see these are ongoing questions, so I haven't seen some of these. Uh, yeah, do you wanna, are there any specific questions you wanted uh, me to answer at this point? Could you read them out? Yep, there are certainly some interesting ones. So David Smith brought up a few. Um, licenses is a good point that comes up a lot that he mentioned. Often in Haskell, there are very few libraries for a given purpose. And on top of that, having a GPL library in a critical piece could throw a wrench in your project if you don't write your software that you have to distribute. Right. Okay. So um, there are two aspects to that. One is just general Haskell libraries available that you can get from Hackage, and then the other is uh, libraries that, that the GHC is using. Uh, the, G, the, one that, the thing about GHC using, GHC has a dependency on GMP. Uh, GMP is a GPL library, I think actually LGPL, if I remember correctly, from, yes. from GNU. And uh, with the way that the linking goes, on Linux and I believe on Mac, it's always dynamically linked. And uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not giving any legal advice, so uh, no one sue me after this, and I would have to check to see if anything has changed since the last time I've looked at this or if uh, I'm having a, you know, a, a memory issue at this point. But I believe on Linux and Mac, you're safe to distribute your Haskell compiled binaries because they'll dynamically link against the GMP on the system. Whereas on Windows, it actually statically links in the library and therefore you have to be a little bit more, a little bit more creative. Uh, there's an alternative to GMP, which is integer simple. And that means you'd have to compile your own GHC, but it also means that a lot of common libraries aren't going to end up working. Uh, a friend of mine actually uh, recently was telling me about some of the woes he had 
trying to move their code base over to integer symbol. So for the most part these days, you, you are stuck with, uh, with uh, integer GMP. When it comes to distributing uh, code on Windows, there are approaches that you can use, such as distributing the object files. That's something that really requires a little bit uh, of a longer conversation. On the other hand, what a lot of people are doing with Haskell is really writing server-side software. When it comes to writing server-side software, you really don't have very many issues at all when it comes to the GPL, unless you have some kind of a corporate requirement. We've seen that uh, as well. Some companies simply have a rule, no GPL software. That can become a very funny conversation when you explain to them, you guys know you're using Linux on all of your systems and Linux is GPL as well, but usually you get a blank stare at that point and get told, no, we don't use GPL anywhere. Uh, so now if we're looking at the Haskell library ecosystem, what's the answer to this? Most libraries are permissively licensed in the, ha in the Hackage ecosystem. Usually it's BSD3 or MIT, and those are pretty, uh, pretty permissive. There's not much of an issue. And one of the things we've worked with customers with in the past is providing some kind of licensing reporting. And it's really, it's a rarity when there's something in the uh, dependency chain that is actually a problem. Another good comment related um, to this problem was distributing your code on Windows specifically. Mm -hmm. Right, so distributing on Windows, uh, you can, one option is you can give the, the source code. That's always an option in these kinds of cases. Assuming that that's, the, that's not the direction you wanna go with, you would really need to consult with the legal team at your company. Uh, but I do believe that distributing the object files is a workaround that people have used in the past. Or, sorry, not distributing, making available the object files. So David Smith also mentioned that um, using the FFI <clears throat> on Windows has issues where it's easier on Linux. Um, I don't, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Well, I know I know that uh, another person on our team, uh, Nicholas Ambushan, has worked with some of these issues. There's some timer issues. There have been some uh, runtime system issues. There are some issues around the interruptible FFI when it comes to uh, to Windows. Putting all this together, Windows Windows support works in in Haskell, but there are always some of these rough edges. An option which is becoming more appealing on a regular basis is using Windows Subsystem for Linux. And I've done development on Windows uh, both with and without WSL. WSL is very, it's an amazing piece of, uh, of uh, engineering. They've done a great job and it works very nicely. I wouldn't say it's perfect. There are some issues, but those issues are getting knocked down. And if you are on Windows, you do have those licensing issues and you really want to get the best possible runtime experience similar to what you get on Linux, WSL may be something you'd want to look into. So one of the questions that I see in the text chat from Bruce, do you have any recommendations for how to work with existing local user groups or establishing new Haskell oriented user groups to encourage developers to learn Haskell and companies to start pilot projects? Uh, so at FP Complete, we haven't actually worked with local user groups directly in that kind of a way too much. I've done a little bit of that personally, uh, working with local user groups. But to be honest, because of, uh, mostly because of where I live, I live in a, a remote part of Israel. Uh, I haven't done a lot with local groups so much. Occasionally, groups in other parts of the world have reached out to me, and I've worked, uh, worked with them that way. In that way, most of what I do is typically based on uh, on internet-based interactions. And as a company, we've done a lot of that as well. So these webinars would be an example. You're more likely to see, uh, see us doing webinars than to go out of our way to start a local group simply because we're able to have that wider reach. And that's really, that's actually something you would see over and over with FP Complete. Everyone who works with us is, uh, is distributed geographically. Uh, we don't have any kind of a home office. So we're all very much used to this idea of working remotely and interacting remotely.
Okay, another one that I see, just to be clear, which is the main selling point for Haskell, taking into account that we have less people to choose from? For example, in order to get speed, we would choose C or C++, right? Uh, yeah, so if, if what you're looking at is we have to have the cheapest, most readily available hiring base possible, my answer would be, no, that's not Haskell. And if your answer is we have to have absolutely the fastest code and we can't have any kind of GC pauses, uh, I'd also say Haskell's not the choice for that. If you're talking about we want to have a, we want to take a team of smart engineers who are motivated to use good tools, and we want to put out software which is going to implement standard kind of business logic, and we want to make sure that this code works correctly and can be maintained over a long period of time without introducing major vulnerabilities and major bugs, that's where I'd say that's Haskell's advantage. The way that Haskell uh, allows you to rely on the type system to avoid bugs, the way it allows you to rely on immutability to get concurrency, the way it lets you write simpler code, which is less coupled, those are the kinds of benefits that I would say. So yeah, it depends. If, uh, if my goal was I need to get software which is going to run in uh, with uh, you know, the lowest CPU overhead, I wish it was Haskell. I wish I could say that that's the answer, but that would be a lie. That wouldn't be a, a place to use Haskell. Boris asks, any recommendation of using Haskell in microservices architecture, which are so popular today? So I'm not going to answer the question of what I think of microservices architecture, whether that's a good thing or not. But the direct question you've, a you've asked, uh, assuming that your company is using microservices, does Haskell fit in? My answer is absolutely 100% yes. Haskell's got a very strong story for being deployed uh, to sta you know, standard systems like Docker and Kubernetes that most people are using, be managed in that way, interacting over a network interface, sending and receiving JSON over HTTP, which a lot of these microservices are doing. That is exactly in Haskell's sweet spot. And you're able to interact with a, with a team which is writing their piece of code in Python. One of the things that we've seen used is, let's say someone is in fact writing some Python code and they have some kind of complex business logic or they have some kind of CPU intensive task or they need something that needs to be parallelized. Whatever they're doing that they've decided they don't wanna do that in Python or they don't wanna do that in the front end web server. This is a perfect time to, to pull out Haskell. You're already in a microservices environment saying that we're gonna offload these tasks to something else makes sense. And now you're squarely in the area of this is the sweet spot where Haskell delivers the strongest value. So how long is your beginning online Haskell course and cost. So the costs are available on our website. I'm not going to uh, mention that right now simply because I don't remember offhand what the costs are for the commercial, ha uh, for the uh, Haskell success program. But the, uh, the duration actually depends quite a bit. A standard one that we do is something along the lines of two hours a day. Uh, let's say two hours a day, four or five days a week for, uh, for three weeks. When it comes to the intermediate course, it's usually uh, less times per week that we meet, either one to two times per week. Again, we like to do around two hours. We find that two hours a day is a good amount of time. And then we like to spread it out over a few extra weeks so that people have some time to go and work on some uh, projects and come back with some real world questions. Usually at some point in this process, we like to transition from it being a real you know, proper training course into instead a code review course so that we're looking at actual problems people are running up against instead of theoretical, uh, you know, theoretical curriculum that we've put together. Oh, the question about the MOOCs. Uh, I actually reached out to Coursera and I never got a response. Uh, I, I, I do not personally have a lot of experience with MOOCs. I think there are other people in the Haskell community who have done a little bit more than I have on this. So there may be more efforts underway, but 
at right now I can tell you I've I've done the initial bit of research on this, but I haven't really put a lot of gasoline on that one. So the three biggest commercial areas for Haskell, well, a big one is in fact uh, the finance world. There's a lot going on in um, in banking, in uh, financial services in general. And if you, we can, let's, at this point, let's just call it uh, a separate category. There is a lot going on in blockchain. So you could call that as being part of FinTech and therefore part of finance, or you could say it's a separate category. Blockchain is very popular right now. Uh, a lot of the Haskell uh, commercial projects that have started seem to have a tilt in that direction. I'd probably say that the third category is just general web development. You see a lot of companies who are using Haskell as a web platform and not really doing too much, which is uniquely Haskell in the sense that you may have thought of. We're using Haskell as a general purpose programming language. Any comments on Haskell versus Scala? I'm not gonna claim to be an expert on Scala because I am far from an expert on Scala. I would say that if you're on the JVM, Scala makes a lot more sense. And if you have to have native code, Haskell makes a lot more sense, but that's a very specific kind of uh, constraint. Beyond that, Haskell sticks to its guns of being a purely functional programming language. Scala is, in, is trying to merge the worlds of OO and functional programming together. From the little bit that I know of this, which again, I'm not an expert, I think that the pure functional approach makes a lot more sense. It's better to be disciplined about these things. I understand it, it makes a lot of sense if you're in the JVM to provide access to the OO world. But we have the luxury in Haskell of not having to integrate with an OO ecosystem. So how bad or good is the idea to implement the library into the financial domain and provide a Python interface for it? Uh, we've done it where we've worked with, uh, with companies who have done this in the past. It works fine. Uh, you could get into some straightforward technical questions. Does it make more sense to work over an FFI? Does it make more sense to work over a network interface? There are technical reasons why you might choose one or the other. Uh, but that's, uh, yeah, that, that's something that we'd really wanna look at the, uh, the details to get deeper into it. As a general question, should we be doing this? Yeah, I would say that makes uh, perfect sense. All right, so what other online Haskell classes and books do you recommend? Uh, when it comes to basics of Haskell, we recommend Haskell book, haskellbook.com. And when it comes to beyond that, if you go to haskell.fpcomplete.com, we've put together a what we call the applied Haskell syllabus. It's the same one I use for the commercial training courses I do in person and the one I do, the ones we do uh, at FP Complete remotely. And that would be, uh, that, that's what I'd recommend. If you start off with, uh, if you start off with those, then it will give you a good basis to be able to move on from there. So the, I, the goal is you should be able to get the basics of understanding common data structures, understanding evaluation, understanding exceptions, all these kinds of basic concepts so that you're then ready to go and read the documentation for more advanced libraries. At some point, if you want to go and read papers on the really advanced stuff in the Haskell ecosystem. Oh, uh, and one other is Simon Marlowe's book on uh, concurrent programming. It's definitely a good call. Okay, so there are still a few, still a few questions. Uh, let's see, I see, actually some of the, the Q&A is a little bit confusing to, to read through. Uh, Chris, were there any last questions that you thought that, uh, that I haven't noticed that we should be addressing? Um, I'm still reviewing as well, actually. The, by the way, the audience, thank you very much. This has been the most active Q&A session that we've, uh, we've had in these webinars. I think we've done like seven or eight of them so far. This is uh, by far most active, so well done. <laughs> Definitely enjoying this. I think as a tail end to the comment on Scala, um, Bruce asked, um, is Haskell on the JVM using ETA or French a viable option? And 
I would add that one of the reasons that um, Haskell has not really taken off on the JVM is exactly the reason that it has to be squeezed into um, Java's object-oriented style runtime. And it never really reaches the same speeds as GHC's native code generator that assumes this kind of language model. However, I don't have anything else to add because I haven't used Regger either. Right, and I, I can't speak to them. Uh, I know that the, you know, the Haskell ecosystem is really built around GHC. Uh, many people wish there was, you know, something more of, a, you know, an updated language standard. At this point, if we're just being honest, industrial Haskell means GHC Haskell. Uh, at, you know, are you getting a good language with Ida or Fredge? I think they're good languages. I don't know of any particular reasons why they're not. I know Ada is based on GHC, but at this point, I think, and I'm not certain of this, I think it's gone far enough away from GHC Haskell that things are going to uh, no longer necessarily compile with both compilers. I could be wrong on that. I, I'm just not up to date on the information. Uh, so all of that is a long way of me saying they're good languages, but you're going to be, I would consider them different dialects at the very least of Haskell than what we uh, typically deal with, and therefore I can't vouch for them. I see a few questions about gRPC. I think there is a gRPC package on Hackage. I haven't worked with it myself, uh, but I know that we were looking into this for a, uh, for a project. Uh, we don't have any plans on developing one ourselves right now, but that would definitely be, if there isn't one out there and people want it to happen, uh, reach out. We can either provide mentoring for this, uh, if, you know, and of course, commercially, if people want this to happen, we can make that happen. Okay. Uh, is there... Okay, so is there a better way to make the most of C++ and Haskell superpowers? Uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, like the superpowers that I think I'm, I'm seeing you mention, C++ does uh, you know, when, we, when we're talking about highly CPU intensive operations that are better done in C++ or C or Rust, the Haskell FFI is really nice. Uh, this, I, actually, I didn't mention it earlier. FFI is one of those things that at least when I was coming from other languages was always intimidating. The Haskell FFI is really simple to work with. And, it, you know, integrating with C++ is a little bit of a pain because of the name mangling, but writing a wrapper around a C++ library isn't that difficult. So if we're talking about, do you, you know, can you combine these things together? You can. Now the downside is you lose some of the, the really nice benefits of Haskell uh, in some cases. In some cases, you end up losing things out. You also end up sometimes, in some cases, acquiring some overhead, which makes this, you know, the FFI version of things less efficient than simply doing things in Haskell and not having to incur the FFI overhead. So there's a little bit of a trade-off. It really depends on how big a project it is that you're looking at, how, how much value C++ is really bringing to the table. In, in my experience, at least, performance is one of those things that uh, developers really love to focus on. And it turns out that for the, you know, for the vast majority of the code you're looking at, it's not quite as important. We want to have code which isn't ridiculously slow. But getting that, you know, getting that extra 50% boost even if, you know, if it's going to be a 50% boost from switching over to C++, in many cases, it's not going to make a difference. I would add to that that the, it is an established practice, essentially, to use C or C++ like a shader language. And a lot of the languages, uh, sorry, a lot of the libraries in Haskell are using some C underneath for some intensive operations. Uh, even the byte string package uses memchur, for example, a C function to quickly search through memory. So it's, it's absolutely common practice that very, very small isolated functions can shell out to C or C++. Just wanted to add. Yeah. Also, the FFI has been improved and should clarify that FFI means foreign function interface. It's the way to call C from Haskell and that it has been improved quite a lot recently. Um, and then it's a lot easier to call C++ in the past than in the past. 
So. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. That's cool to hear. Yeah, you can you can now literally say I want to call a macro, and GHC will figure out and even let you call a macro, not just a function that is defined as a proper symbol. So it's really quite good today. And since Rust is the language that I'm always cheating on Haskell with, uh, I think Rust. I, I think we're getting inline Rust, or someone's written an inline Rust pa uh, package, if I remember oh, correctly. That's a good subject. Yes, inline Rust and. We should mention there's inline R, which yeah. is great if you're using R. And there's also inline C, literally, the we was developed at FB Complete, actually, right? Yeah. Um, so th those are two great packages that very easily let you embed C or R. Cool. OK, so uh, Chris, thank you very much for moderating. Uh, Everyone on this call, thank you very much for the great questions, for the interaction. Uh, if you have more questions that you'd like to reach out uh, about, pop them on Twitter, send, send them via email. We have contact forms on our website. Uh, and if anyone is interested in hearing more about the Haskell Success Program for your company, uh, definitely reach out, uh, reach out to us. We'll be happy to have another conversation. Uh, thank you, everyone, very much. Have a good rest of the day or night, wherever you happen to be.